On February 13, 2013, Think Global School received the honor of a visit from Nils Olson while dining at a restaurant in Washington, D.C. Professor Olson is trained as a social psychologist and statistician and approaches his research and teaching from a behavioral economics perspective. He treated TGS to an interactive lecture about extreme decisions and the roles of choice, flow, and self-control. Thank you very much, Ashley and Lindsay, and all of you for coming out tonight. I know you guys are traveling all over the world and have had a busy schedule today, in fact. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, talk about a few of the things that I've done in terms of some of my research, some stuff that uh, some other people have done. We'll do some interactive stuff and then just open it up for discussion. Um, and what I'm going to talk today about are, are decisions. Uh, it's one of my areas of kind of focus, um, choice, flow, and self-control. And uh, I'll start with this quote by Murray Gilman. He's a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He said, imagine how hard physics would be if particles could think. And really what that's saying is that uh, physics is tough, you know, but understanding human beings and social behavior is also really tough because people are so dynamic. As, as you all know, you're in this truly dynamic, international, integrated uh, curriculum and program. Um, but think about, you know, one of the very cities you've been in. You're in Boston now. Uh, this is New York, right outside of Bryant Park. It's one of my favorite spots to go and just buy an espresso and watch people for about three or four hours. Um, but think about when you're navigating through those crowds and all the information that's coming at you and people that are coming at you, you can't possibly process all that information, right? So that's just one of the things you have to manage just on that corner, but then you expand that you know, further to kind of life. And this is where we get into real decisions and really how I got involved in decision-making research. Um, Years ago, my brother Hans and I, uh, our dream was to play professional tennis. And um, so we were, did all the junior tennis and things like this, playing tournaments, <laughs> constantly played uh, Division I tennis in college. Um, and so, you know, we looked up to people like Maria Sharapova, Rafa, you know, the bull. Um, and actually, when I was just about close to your age, maybe a couple years older than you, I was working here in the D.C. area in a restaurant. I was a server in a restaurant and working at NIH as a research assistant doing a couple different jobs uh, and teaching tennis at a local country club. And actually it was while I was in this restaurant that a gentleman who was the father of two of the students I was teaching at this country club uh, came back to me and said, Nils, I just saw you here in the restaurant. You look very hot and sweaty. He said, and I can change all of this for you immediately. He says, if you come to my villa in Italy, and he said, you know, the only catch is you're going to have to teach the kids tennis and take them skiing in the Alps and meet lots of interesting people. Um, so needless to say, when I really broke down the decision, I decided not to do it. And what I always wondered is what could have been the case in the sliding doors of life. You know, if you make this decision or you don't make that decision. Um, and so I literally sort of laid out what are the pros and the cons. Um, at the head level, kind of the computational level of the decision, think about you know, maximizing your outcomes. You know, are you going to make some money doing this? What kind of experience are you going to have? What are going to be the downsides? And then there's sort of the heart and gut level. There's something that either at your gut says, this feels like the right choice, or this doesn't feel like the right choice. Um, and basically, decisions are, by, are driven by a number of things. Emotions, context, the alternatives we have complexity of the task, and then also the cognitive resources we all have, right? So you have your G-level intelligence, it's genetically what you come into the world with. Um, you have time constraints, complexity of the information, stress, you know, all those things influence your ability to process information. With all of that, we can think about how we have shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts that we call heuristics, biases, and schemas. Okay, and many companies, in fact, use this in their branding to do research about all of us to see what we're buying when to try to get a pattern, kind of constellation of likes and dislikes that we have to better cater to those in some ways and also get information for their companies. So some of the big ones that do things like this are places like Saatchi and Saatchi, J. Walter Thompson. Those are big advertising firms that are worldwide. And then A.C. Nielsen. Have you ever heard of the Nielsen ratings? They rate TV shows, etc. Really the news programs and shows are trying to get the highest ratings they possibly can because that affects how much they can sell their commercial space for, right? Where, where they're advertising things in between programs. That has gotten really sophisticated over the years. It used to be that you would just write down on a patent paper what each of your family members were watching, what they liked, disliked, and it was pretty uh, low tech. 
Now they actually have a box that they send out to about 4,000 randomly selected people that are going to participate in the ratings. Uh, it has a camera that looks at what is subtended on your retina. It can see what part of the image you're actually looking at by seeing its reflection on your eyeball. Um, so the detail of data and the complexity of data they have is incredible, but then they have to think about what are they going to do with that information. Here's some of the stuff that, that happens sometimes. Uh, so for example, they find, credit card companies find there's a very high correlation between whether people purchase carbon monoxide detectors, premium bird seed, and felt pads for the bottom of their chairs and whether it be a good, solid credit card payer. Are they going to pay on time? Will they be a responsible person? Those things tend to co-vary with that, okay? But there's a lot of other things like that, right? Think about when you go, everybody knows you go to the grocery store and you're starving, right? You're going to buy a lot more food. This is a no-brainer. But actually what we're finding now is that not only do you buy more food, you buy more shoes, more coats, cars, everything else. Why, why do you think that might happen? If you're really hungry, that you'd even buy non-food items. Yeah, the desire to satisfy something. That's it? Yeah, that, that's, that's good, right? Desire to satisfy? Yes? That's what I said. Okay, I was right. <laughs> so right, you, you're literally in survival mode, right? So you have to collect resources. I'm sure I meant that next yeah. time I buy parish. Just remember that. Don't fall for that trick. <laughs> right? Yeah, eat first. Um, and then there's even the risk. You know, do people spend their money on things like alcoholic beverages or other things like this, or on dental care. And literally what they use the credit card for tends to also co-vary with how responsible they are as a, as a credit card uh, person. Uh, not credit card person, but as a, uh, as a consumer. Now I have one. That's where we get to the interactive part. I like to make it as interactive as possible. Okay, so what I'm going to do, you guys can just think of this uh, in your head here, and I'm going to read a list of words, okay? And, and just don't write anything down when I'm reading them out, but I want you to remember them as best you can, because I'm going to ask you to free recall them, okay, once I finish the list. Okay, I'm just going to do a couple lists. So here's the first one. Gravel, road, sand, smooth, edge, coarse, jagged, rugged, Uneven, pebbles, callous, harsh, tough, gentle, bumpy. Okay, so now just commit that to memory, okay? <laughs> Remember as many of the words as you possibly can. Okay, now we're going to go on to list two. Dream, drowse, rest, snore, doze, wake, yawn, insomnia, pillow, awaken, comfort, Slumber, awake. Okay, how many of you remembered gravel, road, or sand from list one? There's a lot of the, a lot of you guys. What about jugged, rugged, uneven? Okay. How about tough, gentle, bumpy? Okay, so a good little number there. List two: dream, drowse, rest. How many of you remember that? Okay. How about yawn, nap, insomnia? All right, about 25 percent. Peace, slumber, awake. Okay? And two additional ones here. For list one, how, do, how many of you remembered the word rough? Just targeting a specific word here on the list. Okay, and how many of you remembered sleep? Okay. So, interestingly enough, a lot of people remembered the beginning of the list. I read the first three words there, and almost everybody got that correct. A lot of you got the last three. That's recency, so primacy and recency effects. In the middle of the list was tougher. What was interesting about the last two words that I pointed out, rough and sleep, I never actually read those words. <laughs> right? So how is it that those were actually higher frequency than some of the middle of the list words? Yes? Because you associate. It's your associate. That's right. It's, uh, here, I'll pass this around just so you guys can see this. Um, you can see all the words, there's actually many lists here, but I just did a couple for demonstration, but that's absolutely correct, that you have a strong association of prototype associated with that list, and the gestalt of that made you think of these other words that are very representative of that prototype. Now that's just a little demonstration with some words, but what could be the implications in the real world of something like that? You know, it doesn't matter that you might rely on a prototype more than you should. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Advertising does. It, it can do stuff like that, yeah. It's yeah. subliminal, subliminal suggestion. That's right, yeah, and can tap into really strong impulses, memories, all sorts of things. And then where else in life might this really be pivotal in terms of the accuracy of your memory? School. School, yeah, absolutely, that's important. And that, and the situation actually when you're picking in a criminal case we have to look and see. There you go. Actually, exactly right. Like in a criminal case, let's say you're in a jury. And uh, actually what I was going to do, but I, you know, it was a little bit hard to pull off here. I was going to wear a second shirt, a red shirt. And uh, while you're working on that, I was going to go and change shirts and just see if you noticed that I had changed shirts. <laughs> a lot of times, believe it or not, people don't notice things like that because they're so hyper-focused on a specific attribute. Uh, and this can happen in juries with eyewitness testimony. It can happen when you're hiring employees. Yeah, it can happen just in everyday interaction. Uh, if you know the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, um, one of the reasons he wrote that book was that he had grown his hair out like he had it when he was a teenager. And he was walking through the streets of Manhattan. He writes for The New Yorker, and he's you know, one of the top authors in the world. The police pulled him over, and they said, uh, you look like someone we're looking for. You know, he said, well, can I see a picture of who you're looking for? And they showed him the picture, and he said, I look nothing like that person. They said, you know you're right. That is, that is true. And it really scared him. You know, and he thought, man, it's incredible how strong these prototypes can be. And he wanted to understand a little bit more about how people make these decisions in a blink-like fashion versus thinking through them uh, kind of more systematically. And that gets to something called change blindness, uh, where there's a failure to notice a change in a visual object. Um, this could be caused by shifts in attention, the visual field, any sort of eye movement. It's possible. And I'm going to show you one quick demonstration. So we just cover that for one second. So we'll try to. Uh, get as much of the sound here as possible. This is about one minute. It's actually a, a commercial that was run in London. Here it is. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 30. Yes. Yes. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> Amazing. So it's a PSA watching out for cyclists. <laughs> So, uh, oops, lost this. so that one I thought was particularly interesting because um, at first when you guys were laughing, I thought many of you saw the bear the first time and got the correct count. But then I heard some of you said, oh yeah, I've actually seen this before and you missed it again. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. And I've done it too. You know, we've all done this. It's very easy to do. So what they really tried to pick was a very obvious change. Um, there's actually, there are researchers at Harvard that do this change blindness too, and they literally have people coming in for a psychology experiment to a counter. And there's a gentleman there checking them in at the counter who's wearing a blue shirt. And they check in, he says, would you mind signing the consent form? While they're signing the consent form, he ducks down, seemingly to get a piece of paper, and another guy pops up with a red shirt. Um, and they want to see how many people notice that it's a different person with a completely different shirt. And many of them don't notice. Um, and it's an example of how you can in a very <laughs> controlled setting of a really obvious change and oftentimes people will notice because of how they prioritize information, how much other stuff is happening. So just think about that complex street corner in New York or in Hong Kong or Buenos Aires, all the places you all have been, right? It's very easy for this to happen. We can also think about two systems of the way that we process information, cognitive information. 
This is really work by Stanovich and West and Danny Kahneman who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a recent behavioral economics book and he's probably one of the leading experts in that area. He's a professor at Princeton. Uh, you can think of System 1 and System 2. System 1 is kind of the blink side of it. System 2 is the think side of it. So on the, on the System 1 side, it's fast, automatic, unconscious, experiential, innately programmed, uh, effortless, and emotional sometimes. In this way, you're kind of thin slicing the behavior. Bob Rosenthal came up with that originally. Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in the book Blink. I put these names here, Mia Hamm, Roger Federer, Jimi Hendrix, Frederick Yonet, Gabrielle Douglas, Amanda Beard, LeBron James, and Magnus Carlsen because they're all aficionados within their respective areas. Starting from Mia Hamm with soccer, down to Magnus Carlsen, he's about your age and he's the number one chess player in the world. He's from Norway. Um, but what they're able to do is go from system two, the effortful processing, to almost like an instinctive-like state where they really even aren't thinking about what they're doing. They're feeling it rather than thinking about it. That's what experts are able to do. But that takes some stuff to do that. So when you test people in the system one side, you know, you show them an image like this. Well, you know, how do you react when you see this image? You think of the London Games, or you think of the Olympic Games. You might think of a lot of things because it's such an international event. Um, when you see this, you know, how do you react? What, what are you thinking about? You might have a real visceral response, right, to these. On the system two side, it's the rational, slow, analytic, logic-based thought. It's controlled, it's conscious. It's effortful, it's explicit, it's not implicit, in that you're really making a very concerted, systematic effort to process informi the information. Um, but what those experts are able to do is to put in the number of hours that all this happens very fast and automatically. They have a muscle memory from uh, whether they're in athletics or music or science or, or whatever the case may be. So here's a system two version. What, what's the answer here, 17 times 54? I'm coming up with 918 off the top of the head, but uh, right. So good. Now, while you guys are working on that, let's talk about emotions and decisions, okay? Um, and really, how that could come into play. Uh, emotions can actually significantly uh, influence the way that you process information. All those emotions can be euphoria, boredom, horror, etc. Um, and can have a powerful impact. When you think of somebody like Lindsey Vaughn, you know, one of our, the top skiers, the downhill skiers from the U.S. Um, unfortunately got hurt recently, but you know, phenomenal athlete and I'm sure will be back a, as soon as is possible. Um, and then we even think about companies that use this emotions and decision making. You've heard about this fancy yoga store, Lula Lemon Athletica. I'm pretty sure you probably have. What do you know about the way they interact with customers that might be different from another place? They left my dog in the store. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, they're very welcoming and they're always talking about engaging and have activities in the store. Right. They have activities in the store. I mean, as an example, I was in a uh, part of DC um, about uh, two years ago. I was in the Whole Foods and I could hear them playing uh, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson really loud. You know, I just heard it. It sounded like a live band. I went out to see what it was. It was the Lululemon store across the street. They had a DJ and the whole deal, and they said, hey, you want to come in and listen to some music? The 38 minutes later, I walked out with a pair of yellow shorts that I never thought I would purchase. <laughs> and if they had said, would you like to buy a $90 pair of shorts, I would have immediately said no. You know, but unfortunately, uh, they come in at a different level, right? So it's one of the things they, they do well. Many places do this. Uh, they try to build community. They try to build a relationship uh, that's much more powerful than a straight transaction. Because if it's just a straight transaction, what alternative do you have as a savvy consumer? Yeah. Sorry? You can go online, right? You can buy anywhere in the world. And so if it's just price, that probably won't do it. Um, Here's another example. This is a Danish stereo manufacturer called Bang & Olufsen. Um, and they have some stereos that are pretty pricey. You know, they, they can be up to $70,000. They can be down to less than $1,000. Uh, how do you sell a very expensive stereo system, for example? Well, I actually took a class in to talk to the manager of one of these stores who was a former art dealer from New York City. He said he knew nothing about stereo equipment. And so what he said is when people come to the store, he does not say, how are you doing and can I help you? He says something like, I hope the coal train isn't too loud. 
you know, again, he's building a relationship. Because his thinking is, it's very easy for someone to leave Bang & Olufsen and say, I am not going to give a lot of money to this huge corporate conglomerate. Much more difficult to say no to Barry, right? Their new friend. And he talked about how it's unbelievable even the things that people will share. So this is just an example of some of the stuff in that place. Um, <clears throat> then we go to, uh, this is some of the research I've done actually, looking at whether there might be an optimal number of products, proposals, or even options of any sort to present to people. It could be anything, any options you want to present to somebody if you want to increase the probability that they're going to select something there. So to do this, uh, let's divide the room in half. We divide it right down here. So you guys will be group A. You guys could be group B for the moment. So group B, if you don't mind just closing your eyes for one second. And group A, you're going to look at the screen, okay? So group B on this side, eyes closed. Group A, if you could just please make a choice, just silently, think about what you prefer. Okay, on this side of the room. Group B, your eyes are still closed for a second. Okay, everybody have their choice? Okay, and I'll, I'll clarify in a second. So just make a silent choice now. If you guys can close your eyes for a second, and this side of the room, group B, you can now just silently make a choice. Think about what you prefer from the options there. Everybody have their option? Can yeah, everybody can open their eyes now. So what gave in group A was this, a choice between two gym memberships. And I purposely picked, uh, it, it's, it's one of the more expensive gyms, um, but it could be anything. It could be gyms, it could be cars, computers, whatever. Um, and we have two options here. One is a basic gym membership for $160 or a premier membership for $240. What did you guys select? Basic. Basic, so we had a lot of basics there, okay? For you guys, this side of the room, we, and I would have done the same thing, we had a basic for 160, a premier for 240, and then a premier plus a personal trainer for 240. What did you guys pick? Premier and trainer. Okay, what, what's happening here? You get more bang for your buck, right? Yes, you get relatively more bang for your buck. That's absolutely right. But the first two options are exactly the same here as they are here. And traditional economics would say that when you add additional options, it should water down the preference. What we find is it matters what you add. It doesn't necessarily water it down. Okay, that basically came from the study we ran many years ago. Uh, I did it with uh, Constantine Sedikides, Dan Ariely. Um, and we're looking at the difference between prescriptive behavior, what we think people ought to do, okay, if the models are perfect, and descriptive, what people actually do. This is, what people actually do is kind of the focus of a lot of behavioral economics. Okay, yes, please. Just, I don't know if you're going to address that now, but yeah. um, what people actually do is what, pe no, what people, what you think people are going to do and what people actually yep. do. How right are you normally when, when, you, when you think about what people think they're going to do to what they actually do? Like what's the difference in... <laughs> right. Um, well... And, and, and this is one of the things I'll show you. So, okay, so for, for example, well, well, no, but in that demonstration, right? Yeah. So the first two options were the same for you and for you. $160 versus $240 for the basic of Premier. The only thing that was different over here was there is an Uber Premier option, which is Premier plus Trainer for the same price, but it's still maybe $240 more than you would have originally wanted to spend, but now in the face of the very similar, yet slightly less appealing option, it changes the way you view those options. Yeah. So that's the part that's less prescriptive. Because prescriptive would say, to maximize your utility, it doesn't matter what the context is around it. You'll always go for what's economically the best choice. See what I'm saying? You won't be distracted by... Well, that depends if it's an emotional choice or a logical choice. Well, 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 that's right. And the emotional part is exactly where we're saying it moves away from prescriptive. Because usually the prescriptive does not include the fuzzier parts which we think are, are actually very powerful. Right. You know, yes, very absolutely. So here, right, just to explain what's happening here, let's say we have two probabilities. You're gonna, um, you have a 50% chance of winning $1,000. I've never gone to Vegas, but let's say somebody's going to Vegas, right? On average, they're gonna win $500. If they have a 25% chance of winning $500, that's $125 on average. So A is clearly a better choice on average, although you could get different outcomes in any one trial uh, than B. 
But let's say we have something like this, where it's kind of a toss-up. A 40% chance of winning $100,000, or 0.4 times 1,000, which is $400 on average, or an 80% chance of winning $500, or $400 on average, 0.8 times 500. Here it should be a toss-up, you're indifferent. You know, it's the Honda Acura, um, some people have preferences one side or the other, but it's going to be pretty close. Okay, versus like a Ferrari and a much less expensive car, for example, or less uh, fancy car. Then there's asymmetric dominance. This is what we're demonstrating here, where basically you have a third option that's added, kind of a decoy option. That was the one you had here with the Premier Club membership plus the trainer. So a 40% chance of winning $1,000, a 50% chance of winning $900, or a 40% chance of winning $950. You can see the average earnings here are 400, 450, and 380. And I put actual dollars in this example, so you can see that in the face of actual dollar outcomes, people don't necessarily pick what is the highest dollar yield. So what is the optimal choice here of the three? Straight dollars is B, right? On average, you're gonna get the most dollars. But what do you think happens when you introduce C? A gets more attractive, yeah. right? Now, why does it get more attractive? I mean, because B is still the most attractive. Because it's the same percentage of chance that you get more money for it. Right, same percentage chance you get more money for it, but why would that matter? You're absolutely right that it has the same percentage chance. Why would that be in itself more? You feel like you're getting more for the same amount of risk that you take. Okay, right, so within that amount of risk, you get more. But really, if you're exhaustively looking at all these options, you should should not be distracted by that, right? Yeah. Maybe if you don't want to spend that much money for B, if B is a better option, you go for the second best, and the second best would be out of the first. So there is that possibility, if you're right, a moderate. That That's true. Kind of a middle of the road. And you can actually test for that. Right, so essentially, what we're looking at is the difference between the probability of A, that top option, given three items there, A, B, and C, being greater than the probability of A, just given the two options. So you're really looking at the relative probability. How does A change from A to A prime? What happens based on what's around A? Even though A is still the exact same thing. Just like your basic membership, still a good deal even in the face of those other two options. So in that way, C is asymmetrically dominated by A. So it, it violates the principle of regularity, kind of what we prescriptively think would be the case. So why does that decoy increase the probability of dominating alternative? The choice between A and B is difficult. You've got all sorts of different options, you know, basic and premier. But the choice between the two very similar options, yet slightly discrepant ones, is cognitively easier. The cognitive ease of it, that in and of itself makes it more appealing. So you actually move away from the economic outcomes to just how cognitively easy it is to process. What are the implications of this? Well, think about a trial, going back to Ashley's example. What if a lot of binders of evidence are presented? Right, there's unequivocal uh, evidence versus a very simple, neat story of what could have happened in the case. What might be cognitively more appealing for jurors to process? It's gonna be a lot to process the detailed information. Of course, you wanna make sure you do that, right, to do your job appropriately. But these are things that can impact the way we make uh, decisions. And what it really says is that preferences may not be stable or static. They can be manipulated, kind of moved a bit, which gets back to your marketing example and comment. Uh, this is what marketers use. You know, there are many things that are marketed to us that we don't need for our survival, including those shorts that I bought, right? There's a lot of things like that. Um, so what are applications? You can think about interviews within organizations, presenting a proposal. I gave a merger and acquisition that's at a, a very high level with organizations, negotiations, marketing, but really any place where you're either presenting options or options that are being presented to you. So part of why we're describing this is not to just to make people more savvy in terms of how they present options, but to really make you a savvy consumer of options so you're not duped by the asymmetric dominance that's going on and just going for the cognitive ease instead of looking really carefully at all the options. Again, a lot of this is actually explained in chapter one of one of the co-authors on the study. Dan Ariely wrote this book, Predictably Irrational, a few years ago, and he talks about the irrationality of a lot of the decisions we make. Okay, um, I'm gonna show a couple of other things and then we're gonna go uh, to some more discussion items here. I wanna talk a little bit about this, this is the elaboration likelihood model, okay? And basically all this is arguing is that there are two routes to processing information, a central route and a peripheral route. So have any of you seen like the Korean Air ad? 
Korean Air commercial. It's very soothing and wonderful music, excellence in flight. Virgin Air also has some really creative ads. Um, this is Korean Air. What's interesting about Korean Air, um, it's, it's one of the top airlines in the world. Right, but that was not always the case. In fact, in the 90s, um, they had an issue with sa flight safety. They were having planes actually crash, uh, so much so that Canada would not allow Korean Air to fly over Canadian airspace for a number of years. <laughs> well, they wanted to unpack that and see what was happening exactly, because they had in excellent pilots, incredibly trained, right? Very uh, on the point there. And what they found out it was a, it was a cultural thing that in Korea, it is inappropriate to challenge someone of higher authority. Right? So if the captain made a decision that was not optimal, he or she would not be challenged by anybody else in the cockpit because that's culturally inappropriate to the point where you can have a much more severe outcome at the back end. So one of the ways they addressed this to get them out of the system one processing and you know, back into system two was to use another language, use a neutral language. They used English in this case in the cockpit, but you could have used French, Farsi, whatever, right? Just as long as it's something other than Korean, so that way they could save face in terms of respecting their cultural mores uh, and then also do the job that they were so very well trained to do. And the safety went up through the roof and they're now you know, one of the top airlines worldwide. Virgin does a lot of this with their advertising too. So if you look at their ads, look at how much information actually talks about on-time performance, flight safety. Very little. There's a lot of other stuff happening, right? That's kind of the peripheral side everything other than the transcript of information that you absolutely need. All right, so I've talked about how a lot of, a lot of the ways that we can, our decision making can be broken down, that it's not optimal. You know, we make mistakes, all of us do it. What are some ways you can get around that? Well, one is manage your emotions. Okay, check the context. We talked about context with asymmetric dominance. Uh, less is often more with alternatives. Um, Sheena Angar from uh, Columbia University actually looked at this in terms of how many jams were presented in a grocery store. They either presented over 20 jams or five jams. With over 20 jams, people did a lot of research, they looked around a lot, made very few purchases. When it was brought down to five, much faster and many more purchases. So there comes a point where cognitive overload in and of itself is not appealing and people will literally check out. Um, we live in a country, you know, here in the US where we have lots of choices, almost endless choices. But really, it, it argues that we want to try to keep that balanced. I mean, that's true worldwide now. We're a, we're a global uh, economy. You want to overlearn, automate, minimize stress. Um, so uh, overlearn, automate, you want to think about bundling things. Um, for example, in many hospitals uh, for surgeries, they often had bins with different supplies. And if the syringes would run out, sometimes they'd run out before the draperies and the gloves and masks and things like this, to get around that problem of having differential uh, expenditures of items, they made bundles. So they knew if we had eight bundles, we had enough for eight surgeries and all the staff, everybody there included. Um, that's something you can do in your own world. You can think about simplifying your own world, your own academic world, your own personal world, just to free up some of those cognitive resources for making the more high priority uh, decisions. Uh, simplify and reduce stress. So stress has a huge impact on our ability to make decisions. I bring up athletes here because they're particularly good at staying calm under stress. And one of the best ways you can do that is with breathing exercises. Um, meditation, yoga, exercise, all of that contributes to long-term management of stress, which actually will conserve many of those cognitive resources. And think back to the Greeks, you know, they said sound body, sound mind. There was a reason they argued this because it really has a big, uh, big impact. I'm going to talk about one other um, piece here, and this is on ego depletion, cognitive effort, and money. Now, this one's pretty interesting because uh, I, I'd like you to think about you know, times you've been traveling in a city and you've gone all over the world, the school has, and let's say you're late for something. You know, you're late for a class or for a meeting or for one of your, your incredible trips that you're taking to visit a museum or um, all the different or wonderful things you do. You have to quickly get a meal. You know, sometimes you might need to pay $30 for a hamburger, right? Just to sort of offload that decision. And um, when you're in that time of, type of time constraint, you're more likely to spend more money in those cases. The argument here is that self-control discipline is a finite resource. So if you're really disciplined in all of these areas, it doesn't mean that's gonna necessarily carry over. In fact, 
there might be only so much left in the tank. So you're more likely to do less disciplined things as you move outside of that realm. And we wanted to study this systematically. You know, looking at all these professionals that have incredibly high levels of responsibility and they you know, face dangerous situations and they're able to manage all of this. So we think about uh, shopping, cognitive effort, and ego depletion. And really, just to give you a quick snapshot of how this works, it's basically arguing that willpower is like a muscle, right? If you don't use it at all, you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to have a lot of discipline. If you use it too much, it's going to break down and you're going to overload and that's where you're buying the $30 hamburger, okay? The most pizzas are eaten on Friday evening, just everywhere. Well, why do you think that might be the case? Weekend break. Weekend break. People are at their limit. You know, they're like, oh man, you know, I just, that's it. Today, all that stuff has to, you know, go out the window, right? Because we're, we're human beings. You need to manage all that and, and balance it. We think of an impulse biting, uh, eating and drinking, shopping even for non-food items. We talked about that while you're hungry. Um, did you know, by the way, where do you think people spend more money when they're carrying a basket in a grocery store or pushing a cart? Uh, there's more space to yeah, there's more space at the garden, that's true. And then where do you think people make less healthy choices carrying the basket or pushing the cart? It's actually carrying the basket. Why, why do you think that might be? Yeah. Um, most of the processed foods are lighter. So well, that's a good point. It's, it's manageable, that's right, for the basket, yeah? Because you're not really looking at it when you're carting it to see it. Oh, that's good, right. You're not reprocessing it over and over again, that's very true, yeah? When I think about carrying a basket, that means I'm going in quickly and I'm going to make some fast decisions. Whereas if I have a cart, I have time, I'm looking at it, so right. I would just make those quick decisions and probably go for junk food. <laughs> Yeah, junk food's fast. It's also going to give you quick calories. Not necessarily the best calories, but when you're carrying the basket, you actually were going to use more resources and you need, your body goes to, I need more calories mode. Which is kind of counterintuitive because you think, man, I'm just the optimal in fitness. I'm carrying the basket. I'm doing the stairs. I'm not eating pizza on Friday. I'm trying to do all those things. So we thought about, you know, what's a challenging situation? And it could be anything. In this case, we gave people a, a task of buying a gift for their boss, okay? And we were looking at this with the self-restraint and really arguing that we're anticipating they're going to have um, the least restraint here where there's basically no self-control, right? Um, total self-constraint, uh, self that's also bad in terms of the amount of money they're going to spend, all these sorts of things, resources they would expend. And so we looked at it in terms of the price of the gift they purchased, okay? And the way we manipulated this was through task complexity. So we had them go to a website to choose a gift, and we either said just choose any gift you want versus choose a gift of this type versus choose a gift of this type, this quality, this year, all of these specific parameters, making it more and more difficult for them to find the exact gift we want. The more difficult we made it, the more they spent. But notice they spent a lot also when it was not at all difficult. And that argues for the idea that self-control is like a muscle. This episode is brought to you by Think Global School. For more information, visit thinkglobalschool.org.